But I'm excited to be here with you guys. If you're new here, thank you so much for, for accepting the invitation, uh, for just pulling into the, to the parking lot and stepping foot in this church. I believe God wants to um, have you walk out of here better than the way you walked in. And um, I'm so excited. I've been a part of this church for 13 years this coming up Easter. And uh, my life was radically changed because of this house, because the, of, of the God I met in this house, but more importantly, the people I, I have been surrounded by. And so I'm excited to, to speak to you guys for the next 35 minutes or so. Um, and we're going to jump straight, straight into this thing. We're in a series throughout the month of March heading into Easter called The Stories We Tell. Everyone's got a story. Every single one of us, God is writing our story. Pastor Bronson started last week speaking of a satyrian Roman soldier who experienced the revelation of Jesus Christ as he hung on a cross. And now his story is being told for generations. And every single one of us here in here has a story. And the whole point of this series is that we're looking at individual lives in the Bible who encountered Jesus. And from those encounters that they'd had with Jesus, the stories from that encounter we want to listen to. Because what they have to say and what is written about them in God's word, not only is it truth, but it should challenge us, it should change us. Ultimately, it should lead us closer to the one who has saved us. And one thing you'll realize over the next, um, this Sunday and next Sunday is the stories we read about, the people's lives we will learn about, the people's lives that you're sitting next to, our details of our story are vastly different. That the life you're living, what you've gone through, what you will go through, what you're currently in today, the details of your story are very different. Not just from those we read in the Bible, but even from the ones of those that you're sitting next to. Even, even those that are married, the details of your life are different. But the one thing, the whole point of the series is, is for us to catch that with all of the differences in our stories, there is still one message that God is getting to us and through us for our story to tell. And the message that God is wanting to first get to us and the message that God is then wanting to get through us is this one message here. And I hope you catch it, that Jesus is king. Everyone's story is different. Everyone's pace is different. Everyone, some of you have longer paragraphs and chapters. Some of you have shorter ones. Some of y'all's book is bigger than others. That does not matter. What is the same, though, is that when God, when we encounter God, the message of Jesus Christ doesn't just get to us, but our story then becomes getting the message through us. And that message is, say with me, Jesus is king. Now, talking about stories, you ever encountered a bad storyteller? Anybody? Right? We've all had that, right? You ever had a conversation with someone who just tells really bad stories, right? Maybe it's your boss. Uh, maybe it's some of your coworkers. Maybe it's your, your friends, family members. Maybe it's your spouse. I'm ah, just kidding. It's, it's not your spouse. Come on, of course it's not your spouse. What are you talking about, guys? Your, your wife, I mean, your wife is so efficient in her storytelling. She don't add any extra details. She gets right to the point. Come on, guys. Your wife would never... At 12.37 at, at night, when you got to get up at 5 in the morning, she would never get the zoomies and start telling you about her day. And, and what could have taken two minutes, she ends up taking two hours, and, and, and she's just excited, and you're already counting. She, she would never, because she's your spouse is the best storyteller. Have you ever encountered a bad storyteller? You know you're in the presence of a bad storyteller three ways. The first way is they're just so gifted at giving details that do not matter. <laughs> it just, well, you've said that five times. I mean, what's, what's the next? Another way you know that you're in the presence of a bad storyteller is that it's something you do, actually. You, you, they're, they're talking for like 30 minutes now. Again, it could have taken three minutes. And now you've already said 10 uh-huhs. And you've said about like 15, wow. And then this is my favorite. You said about like 20, man, that's crazy. <laughs> You ever, you ever, and you know nothing going on in the story, and the whole time you're just, man, that's crazy. Wow. What? Uh -huh. That's wild. And we all leave bad storytelling conversations with the same idea. What was the point? What was the point? What, what, are you, what are you trying to say? And I just want to encourage you in this series, that's what we're trying to get you at, that the story of your life has a point. 
That the story God is writing for your life matters. There's a point to it. And there's a point to it, and it matters because there's a message that God is getting first to you and through you. And you have value in this world. You don't just need a mic and be on the stage. But your story and the message of Jesus is king is what didn't just transform your life, but has the ability and opportunity to transform the lives around you. And the good news about this message that I want you to see is that the message of Jesus Christ never gets old and it never loses its power. It's the one story that we never get sick of. It's the one story that we're always in awe of. It's the one story that never loses its power. So over the next 29 minutes and 45 seconds, I want to look at an individual in the Bible named Mary. And I want her story to speak to us. And I want us to see the message throughout the encounters that she has with Jesus, the message she encountered and ultimately began to speak through her story in her life. This Mary that we're looking at is actually described as Mary of Bethany. There's a lot of Marys in the, in the New Testament. Don't get them mixed up. One's Jesus' mom. Another one was a demon-possessed woman who's at the feet of the cross. And now we have Mary of Bethany. Mary and Beth, of Bethany has three encounters. Now, to bring understanding, you're like, what, is that like your last name, of Bethany? Um, it would be like Joe Eric of San Antonio. That's how they're described at. Because she always encountered Jesus in her hometown, right where you're at. So Mary Bethany has three encounters. And the first point today that I want you to write down is Mary's first encounter. We're going to look at Mary's first encounter. And it's found in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Luke chapter 10, verse 38, and this is a short first encounter story. Not a lot of details, but so much to be said and spoken of. Luke 10, verse 38 says this. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village, Bethany, where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Now, time out, Pastor Joe. I thought we were talking about Mary. Who's Martha? I'm so glad you asked. And I'm so glad the writer, Luke, puts it this way. Because he doesn't first bring up Mary, he brings up Martha. Why? Because there is no Mary without Martha. There is no Mary encountering Jesus without Martha opening her home to him. Let me first tell you this nugget, a side point. The stories that we tell today of the encounters that we will have and have had with Jesus only have happened because a home was open for Jesus to walk into that we were in. The reality of my story is I'm not here today. I'm not who I am today without my Martha in my life. And that was my one of my best friends still to this day, Brett Casey, who nagged me over and over and over again to come to Wednesday night launch our youth ministry here at the church. Sophomore year in high school, I'd already done religion. I had done this. I was I was over it, living completely on the fence, back and forth, a hypocrite. And I was just completely like, I don't want to do it. He knew I was in the drum line. He goes, dude, well, just come, drum line, come play. Like, and I thought it more as a gig, not me going to church. I thought I was doing them a favor, not the other way around. And so I ended up showing up, third row, center aisle seat, radically changed of the message of Jesus Christ and forever changed. Why? Because Brett opened the door for Jesus to walk into, and he encountered me there. So many of you who are praying to reach the lost, evangelism is actually quite simple. It's not you knowing the, the, the Bible front and back, which is great and you should do. It's actually you living a life where your home is always open for not just people to walk into, but the door is always open that those who are encountered in your circle will encounter Jesus. So you want to reach the lost? Be a person that opens their home to him for others to experience Jesus. You want your family and friends to be saved. You don't, know, you don't have to memorize the entire Bible. Just be a person that opens their home for them so they can encounter the Jesus you've encountered. You want to experience more of Jesus. Is that your prayer? God, I want more of you. Then remain a person that keeps their door open and home open of your heart for him. So the story continues on. Mary opens her home for Jesus to come into. Jesus accepts the invitation. We don't know how many homes he passed up, but what we do know is he entered into the home that was open. Then in verse 39, it says that Martha had a, had a sister, here we go, called Mary. And the first description of Mary is pivotal for us to understand. Mary, sister of Martha, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. 
We have no record of Mary encountering Jesus prior to this. We also have no record of what they actually talked about and what Jesus was teaching Mary. But what we do know is her posture when the presence of Jesus was at her, at, in front of her. The posture of Mary was being seated at the feet of Jesus, listening to every word being spoken. Hebrews 12 Verse 2 describes Jesus as the author of our faith, the author and the finisher of our faith. And so for Mary, in this moment, the first description and encounter she ever has with Jesus, Mary is in, is in this moment is in the presence of the author of her life. And she sits, and you know what her posture communicates? I imagine her like an elementary child during story time, in the presence of the author, you know what her, her, her posture communicates? It says, the pages of my life, Lord, are blank, and you can start writing as you please. When we're seated before the Lord, listening to what he teaches, wants to teach to us, what we communicate is, Lord, my, the pages of my life are open and empty for you to write. Write as you would please. The question I want to ask you and challenge you with, and I want you to ponder it not just today, but the rest of your week, is what does your posture communicate in the presence of Jesus? Jesus promises in, in the word that when two or three are gathered under his name, he's present. So a lot more than two or three are here, so he's present. So the question in, what does our posture communicate in his presence? Does it communicate what Mary said? Lord, I'm an empty page. Write what you want to write in my life. Or does it communicate what Martha posture said? Let's look at what Martha's posture was. Verse 40. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Now I'm a little offended because I relate more to Martha than I do Mary. So if I'm Martha and I get to heaven, I'm like, yo, Luke, we got an issue. Why you got to do me like that? Like you could have said I was busy doing the Lord's work. You could have said I was serving. But you call me distraction. Like that, I, that, that hits at home because I'm that person. But then the story goes on that she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care? My sister has left me to do the work by myself. Tell her to help me. Imagine, imagine that. Guys, you're looking at your spouse like, that would be my wife. She'd be like, tell her to help me. Imagine that boldness, right? Just telling Jesus what to do. And Jesus looks at her and says, Martha, Martha. The Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Indeed, only one. Here's the one thing. Mary has chosen what is better. And it will not be taken away from her. So what story is being told from Mary and her actions in this encounter? I want you to write this down. We must encounter the Lord with empty pages. If not, we'll be distracted. We must daily, every Sunday, weekly approach and encounter the Lord. When we say come with an expectation, that literally means come with an empty slate. Come with an empty page so that the Lord can write on your life. Are you postured before him with empty pages or a completed book? Are, are, you, are you coming before him saying, Lord, you're the author, write? Or are you coming to him with a completed essay saying, okay, can you just grade it and mark it so I can just make the changes what's needed? See, the better that, that, that Jesus is talking about that Mary did, it's simple devotion. It's sitting, it's listening, it's offering yourself as an empty page. When we encounter, come with an empty page. The second encounter Mary has with Jesus. Time has passed, life has been lived, and we find them yet again in John chapter 11, verse 1. The only issue that you'll notice in this second encounter, it's a different circumstance. Sometimes, you, you, you know, you can come to a place and always count to the Lord like church. But the real life change happens when you encounter him in the places you weren't expecting him. In the hurt, in the pain, in the confusion, in the questions, in the worry. John chapter 11, verse 1, Mary's second encounter. It starts off with this. Now a man named Lazarus. You're kind of like, that's a new character. Lazarus is the brother of Mary and Martha. A sibling. Now, Mary, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the same place they were. The village of Mary and, their, and her sister Martha. Verse 3 through 7 says this. So the sisters, Mary and Martha, sent word to Jesus. Brother's sick. They said, we got to tell Jesus. 
Lord, the one you love is sick. Listen to the relational language. The one you love. How many of you go to prayer with that type of description of yourself? God, the one you love is hurting. The one you love is distraught. The one you love is sick. The one you love is in need. In verse 4, when he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Relational language. And this is how much he loved them. Check this out. This is so good. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, the one he loved, he stayed where he was two more days. That's so offensive. I'm so mad at Jesus right there. Man, I love Martha. I love Mary. I love Lazarus. He said, I'll, I'll just finish what I got to do. Two more days. I'll be there in a second. Two more. So then in verse 17, we fast forward. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Four days dead. The, the Jewish um, superstition was that a soul would stay near the body for as long as three days, just in case there was a way for him to come back alive. So when John writes four days in the tomb, he's saying this dude is dead, dead. No hope. No hope at all. Four days in the tomb. He's gone. There's nothing that can happen. Verse 18. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, Martha heard that Jesus was coming. She went out to meet him. But now let's look at Mary, our character for today. Mary stayed home. We find Mary at the lowest point of her life. Imagine losing your brother. And she stays home. Jesus is coming. I'm staying home. I don't want to go out there. Mary's decision to stay home speaks to the level of her distress and grief. But Martha, the one that was distracted, goes the one that left the door open goes to meet him. And in verse 21 through 27, summarizing it, Martha has an encounter with Jesus. Martha, the one who is distracted, in those few verses, uh, her going out of the house to go meet him, she comes to the realization and conclusion that Jesus is the Messiah. This is where we hear the great um, 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 communication from Jesus when he goes, I am the resurrection. Because she goes, my brother's going to resurrect, you know, when, when you come back again, when the Messiah comes again. He goes, I am that. I am the resurrection. And she goes, you are the Messiah. She understands in that moment that he's the one spoken of. But Mary's nowhere in sight. Why? Because Mary's at home. But then in verse 28, we find Mary. So Martha, she had said this, you're the Lord, you're the Messiah. So she went back and called her sister Mary. Now, if you've got a Bible, highlight this. You're taking notes, underline it, copy and paste it, send it, whatever it is. I want you to receive this next verse. Martha just gets a revelation about Jesus. He's the Messiah. She runs back to Mary, and this is what she tells her. Mary at home, crying, distraught. Martha looks at her sister and says, the teacher is here, and he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. It's interesting, little nugget and little nerd fact. It's interesting that Martha would title and refer to Jesus as teacher to Mary and not Messiah. Mar Martha just came to the realization that he's the Messiah. So why tell Mary the teachers here? Martha was referring to Jesus with the title Mary would have known him by. Teacher. Why, why would Mary know Jesus as teacher? Well, he was the, he's the one that she sat at his feet listening to everything he taught. Only this time in this encounter, Jesus isn't teaching. He's calling her, asking for her. Now, this is where I want to stop because I really believe in studying for this. I read this scripture, jumped down, and I said, I just want to encourage someone in here. This may not be for everyone, but I said it last service, this service, and I'll say it next service. I, I, I prophetically want to speak to someone this verse. Because I believe there's some people and someone in our, in our church that can relate to this moment that Mary's at. And I believe the Lord wants to speak to you through this verse. So this is what I want to say. I believe some, are, some of you are exactly where Mary is, going through the hardest time in your life. And it's not that you haven't called out to the Lord. In fact, you actually have longed to be back to when you first encountered him. 
You're in the hardest time, in the hardest season of your life, going through the worst thing you could imagine possible. And it's not that you haven't sought the Lord. It's not that you're not longing for him. In fact, I really believe some of you, people have been like, man, you should pray about that. Man, you should go to the Lord. And internally, you just want to scream out and be like, I have been. I do want to encounter the Lord. I know who I need to go to. I'm going to him. I just don't know where he's at. And this with boldness, I want to speak to you. The teacher is here and he's asking for you. The teacher is here and he's asking for you. The teacher is here and he's asking for you. Just like Mary would have longed to be home, seated at his feet, distraction free, is the same longing that you have. Going back to your childhood, going back to last week, going back to last year, when you felt like God was face to face with you, when you felt like everything he was saying, it was just, I mean, you just heard it. And now you're at a place alone at the same house you encountered him, but he's nowhere to be found. And the word of the Lord says, the Lord, the teacher is asking for you. And this is my challenge for you. He isn't where you first encountered him because that's where you are. Instead, he is here, somewhere new, somewhere where you least expected, and he's asking for you. So my challenge and my plea to you, if this is for you, meet him where he's at. Get out of the place that you first encounter him because he's asking for you. Have the faith to leave the home you first met him at to go where he's calling you to. So verse 32 says this, when Mary reached the place, because she ran up and and went in faith, when Mary Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if he had been here, my brother would not have died. Same posture. She sees him and falls at his feet. Different location, different circumstance. Same posture. And then verse 33 says that when Jesus saw her now, What's different is Mary isn't looking at him. Jesus is looking at her. He sees her weeping. And the Jews who had come along with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. Again, I don't know who you are, but the the Lord is deeply moved in trouble. Where have you laid him, he said. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And look at his response to this entire moment. He's with the ones he loved. Remember he said that. Lazarus has just died. He knows he's going to raise him. And in the presence of their mourning and weeping, the faith for Mary to step out of the home, the shortest verse in the entire Bible, Jesus says this, Jesus wept. This is the revelation I'm hoping you'll catch today. Mary in this moment, in this moment was expecting a teaching from the teacher, but instead she was embraced with tears from the friend. Mary was expecting another teaching from the one who taught her at her home. Lord, teach my way out of this. Give me the 10 ways to to mourn and get through this. Teacher, teach me. Give me the wisdom on how, what I need to say, what I should do, how we're going to manage this home now without him. Teach me out of this, God. And she wasn't encountered by the teacher. She was embraced with tears from a friend. In one season, seated at the feet of Jesus, Mary was in all of his teaching. In another, falling to his feet, Mary was embraced with compassion. At his feet then, Mary listened to teaching she had never heard of at all. But at his feet now, in John 11, in the worst moment of her life, she felt love like she had never experienced before. So what is Mary's encounter, the story God is writing in this moment, what is it saying? Number two, every encounter brings new experiences of Jesus. You are never too far, never too gone, never too lost. The Lord sees you and is troubled. The Lord will weep with you, and he will encounter you not just where you're at, but what you're in need of in that moment. Just when you think you know the Lord as teacher, you'll realize how much there is still to know him. Because Mary's encounters the friend. And the third encounter, our final encounter with Mary that we know of in Scripture. The good news is Jesus ends up resurrecting Lazarus out of the grave, and then we find them in celebration of that miracle. If you have your Bibles, turn to the next page, John chapter 12, just a few verses. 
and we'll conclude and pray. John chapter 12, verse 1 says, six days before the Passover. The context of this, it's six days before Jesus will go to the cross. He doesn't have a lot of time. In fact, prior to this, he had been telling his disciples, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And now there's six days before that very moment. Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Verse 2, here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served. That girl still served. She, you know what I mean? She wasn't distracted, but she served. Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. And in verse 3, we find Mary. Then Mary, here we go again, Mary. Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, would have been like oil, and she poured it out on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. Now, time out. Hold up, wait a minute. Either way you read this story, with or without context, we're all taken back. She poured it out on Jesus' feet and wipes it with her hair. Immediately, all who are thinking it, both, both that were in audience and there at that time and us reading it today, we're all thinking the same thing. What is Mary doing? Everyone got the ick. Everyone, everyone is like secondhand embarrassment looking at Mary like, Mar Mar Martha, like, she like, she ain't my sister today. Like, I don't know. <laughs> that, that's Lazarus' sister. Right? She ain't mine. And we can try to put it in context, think of that time and culture. It was, it was actually normal that when guests would come over to your house, servants would be there to wash their feet. They didn't have cars. They didn't have shoes. They traveled miles in dirt. So in order to keep the house clean, keep the food clean, and to honor your guests in a way of saying thank you for coming over, you would wash their feet. But that's not what Mary does. Because if you understand it and you look at it, the feet would have already been washed. The guests were already seated at the table. The food that Martha slaved over had already been placed. Grace has already been said. Everyone's about to eat. Then out of nowhere, Mary comes and interrupts everyone's schedule. The party's happening. Everyone's celebrating. And then Mary comes in. And it's one thing she comes in with water and a towel. But no, she comes with the expensive perfume and not with the towel, with hair. And she begins to pour it out onto his feet and begins to wipe it and clean his feet with her hair. Scriptures would have, the scripture described this oil being as expensive as a year's wage. So, so think about what you make in a year. And, and go buy a perfume that costs. And she pours it out before the Lord in the minute, middle of the, of, the, of the dinner. And she begins to just wipe his feet with her hair. So the question we ought to be asking is not what was Mary doing, but why? Why this undignified action, Mary? Why put yourself in such an embarrassing moment? You could have done it behind door, closed doors. Why now? Why, why are you so indignified, Mary? See, reading this passage standing alone by itself leads to many questions. But having read the previous encounters Mary's had with Jesus, it reveals her why. What Mary is doing in this moment is something she had never done before. She had sat at his feet and listened to the teachings. She had cried at his feet and was comforted by him weeping. But in this moment, hear me, church, Mary wasn't just sitting at his feet, but rather she's pouring her oil as worship on his feet because she had finally come to the revelation. Hear the word of the Lord, church. The revelation that Jesus was not just her teacher and that Jesus is not just her friend, but that Jesus is the savior of the world, that Jesus is king and that Jesus is Lord. She wasn't there when Martha had the encounter and said, you're the Messiah. So for the first time, she has the realization and revelation. And we know she did because Mark is also writing the same description of the story. And he writes down in his gospel that Jesus responds to her oil pouring out and washing off his feet. And this is what he says. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Meaning, I told you guys I was going to die. But she's the only one who responded to that revelation. Hear me, church. Mary understood that Jesus didn't just come to teach 
or heal. He came to die. And Mary's response to that holy revelation is an undignified worship. A worship that who cares what people are thinking. So let's ask Mary again. What are you, what are you doing, Mary? Why are you so undignified? And this is what she would have said. Because I finally see it, church. I finally see it. He's worthy. He's worthy of my best. He's worthy of me being embarrassed. I, I'd seen him before, but I ain't seen him like I see him today. I, I, I've heard his teaching. I've seen his tears. But today in this house, he's Savior. And I'm preparing for his death. And that death is where I found salvation. And his death is where I find freedom. So I don't care what people think. He's worthy of my worship. I sat under the teaching and didn't respond. I cried with him and I didn't respond. But today, when I finally understand that he's Lord and he's King and he's Savior, oh, I can't help but respond. I can't help but get undignified because he didn't just come from God to heal my brother. He didn't just come for God to bless me with a little cash. He didn't just come for God to teach me and make me feel better in church. He came to earth because he loved me and he saved me and I can't help but get undignified. I can't help but pour out the best I got because I got the best from God. Come on, church. When do we get so dignified? When do we get so... That's, that's good. That's, thank you, Jesus. Hear me, church. Hear me. When you've seen God move in your life, it calls for thanksgiving. Come on, let's clap, let's honor him. But when you've come to the revelation, hear me, when you've come to the revelation that he's king and that he's Lord and that he saved you, oh, that doesn't just call for thanksgiving. That calls for an undignified worship. That calls for a, I don't care who's looking. I've been bought with the price. I've been, I've been received with open arms. So you're not just going to get a golf clap from me. Oh, you're going to get oil. And I'm going to give you my best. I'm going to give you everything I've got, God, because you're worthy of it. Because in this moment, Mary finally understood that what, what Jesus would go on to do would be better than, he had, than anything he had ever done prior. The cross is better than any blessing he can give you. The sun is greater than any financial blessing he can give you, church. The empty tomb is better than any advice the Holy Spirit can whisper into your ear. And that's the revelation, the message that Jesus is king. Is tr God is trying to get to you today so he can get through you. See, it's the kind of response that the Roman centurion came to when he saw Jesus hanging on a cross. He'd used to seeing dead men on a cross. But for the first time, remember, he, he sees Jesus in Mark 15. He goes, truly, this was the son of God. So what is Mary's story saying to us? Her third encounter. Mary is pleading with this church, with us today. Respond to the revelation. Respond. Respond. Get undignified. And respond. Realize what he's done for you. And the goodness he offers. And the life he provides. And respond. The stories Mary would tell wouldn't just be about what she had heard or saw Jesus do. And believe me, she heard and saw a lot. Probably more than we'll ever see combined. But the story that she would go on telling, it's the story of the time she came to the revelation that who Jesus was, not just what he did. And the story she's telling in this third encounter isn't just about what she has to say, but understanding it's also the story in, in John chapter 12, that's forever told about her. And I conclude here. John 12, verse 3, she pours her oil out, washes him, washes his feet with oil with her hair. And then look at right after. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. The very thing she poured out fills the room. Everyone in the house, whatever Martha was cooking, gone. The fragrance fills the house. Never again would that house smell the way it did that day because Jesus would go on dying six days later. 
that expensive amount of perfume, Mary's not getting that back because scholars believe she didn't even earn it. She's, she got it. It was given to her, passed down. There's no way she could afford it. She ain't buying it again. So never again is that house smell like that. Oh, but the memory of the scent of oil being passed down, poured out, that's forever ingrained, not just in the head, but in the heart of those who are there. Church, can I tell you, you don't gotta know the Bible word for word. You don't even have to have your testimony written out, ready to, come on, you can change a life by you pouring your oil out. I said it last service and I believe it's here today too. There's a lot of fathers in here. Dads, listen to me. Your child may not remember every bedtime story. And I know you probably have fears of like, I don't, I don't know how to preach the gospel to my kids. I don't know how to raise them. I don't, I don't know how to raise them to know God. I, I wasn't raised that way. Can I tell you that more than bedtime stories, more than you trying to get it all right, I prophesy in the name of Jesus to every father in this house. Men, if you would pour your oil out, fragrance would fill your house. A fragrance that would forever be ingrained in your children. That they're not going to remember every conversation. Oh, they're going to grow up. And they're not going to say, oh, do you, that smells like grandma's house. No, they're going to say, there was a scent my dad kept in our home because he was constantly pouring out. Not pouring out information and advice to us, pouring out oil to the king. And I've kept it and I can't get rid of that scent. And I prophesy, homes are going to be filled with fragrance again. Fragrance of oil poured out before the king. Because men, women, sons and daughters, fathers and mothers decided to respond to the revelation. No longer are the days where we as Christians decide to just sit at the dining room table and just be glad that he came and met with us. But no, we're going to get up out of our seat. We're going to undignify ourselves and we're going to pour out the best thing we got. It may not be much, but it's everything we got, Lord. And a fragrance is going to fill the home. A fragrance can still fill your home. Come on, man. A fragrance is going to fill the home. It's going to start smelling different in the name of Jesus. It's going to fill the atmosphere. Sons are going to rise up because of your fragrance. Daughters are going to return home because of your fragrance. Not because of your wisdom, not because of your experience, but because of your undignified worship. So let's pour it out. I want to give you the opportunity and I want to be specific here. If you are a Christian and you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this, this moment right here is not for you. I love you. My plea for you is to, if you've poured it out before and you've accepted him and you've came to that realization that he's Lord, pour it out again. I'm talking to those who have never put their faith in Jesus Christ. Who have never said, Jesus, you're Lord. You're worthy of my worship. I surrender. I commit my life to you from here on out. So with every head bowed and every eye closed for privacy and just give me two minutes. Again, if you've accepted him before, your conviction is poured out again. But in this moment, if you have never believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, right here, this moment's for you. Respond to the revelation. This good news, this message is one that is received, not earned. So receive it and respond. If you're in here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior of your life, on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand in faith with boldness and to respond. Heck, I'll even allow you to stand up if you'd like to. Let's move. One, if you're making this decision today. Two, with boldness, stand up to your feet. Three, and accept the Lord for who he is in your life. Come on, it don't need to be a lot. It could just be one or two. Good. If you're making a decision for the first time in your life, you've never publicly de declared that Jesus is Lord, I want you to stand up. I want you to stand up. Let's be bold. Stand up. I know you're raising your hand. No one's looking around. Stand up. Stand up. Come on. You standing up. Let's lift our hands. Lift up your hands. And I want you to repeat this half for me. Jesus. Come on. This is for you. Standing up. Let's be bold. Jesus. I'm a sinner, 
and I need you. I believe that you are the son of God who came to earth to die, to be buried. And I believe that you have been resurrected. There is an empty tomb. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. In faith, come on, say it. In faith, I receive you as Lord over my life. I receive the message that Jesus is king today. And I will forever follow my Savior. Thank you, God, for your love. And may it follow me all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church, can we thank God for those standing? Come on, can we shout? Can we thank God? There were, there were men and women who accepted Jesus for the first time.